You couldn't imagine more different sounds from a clarinet than these two short excerpts. In Ablauf from 1983, the composer Magnus Lindbergh throws his cards on the table in the most direct and aggressive way possible, splitting the lowest note of the clarinet into its harmonic components to shocking effect. But Mike Mozart's clarinet writing in his 39th symphony from 195 years earlier in 1788 been as surprising to his audience. As the first major composer for the clarinet, his public would surely have been amazed and delighted to hear this instrumental newcomer, even if familiar to them, used in this prominent and soloistic way. Crucially, Mozart is already exploring the clarinet to find his own view on its voice. There's a serene aristocratic soprano in line with the clarinet's role as, in my not unbiased view, the instrument which is closest to the human voice. But it's in conversation with a character who is the very opposite of lyrical, a very much not aristocratic villager grumbling away underneath. You may be wondering why I'm talking about Mozart in a film about the contemporary clarinet, but I wanted to make the point at the start that the composers need to find their own voice for the instrument, going with or against its lyrical nature, haven't changed from Mozart until now. One of the most significant examples of a composer getting it spectacularly right, a little more than halfway on the road from Mozart until now, is the set of three solo pieces by Stravinsky. Here's the first, a folk song-like meditation. Here's the second, a totally different kind of music, using the agility of the clarinet to depict birds in flight, with added freedom given by the absence of bar lines, a significant difference from most earlier clarinet music. The third piece is Stravinsky's take on jazz, an area of music which would have a huge effect on the clarinet's popularity. Very often in London Sinfonietta programmes, a composer might ask us not only to make use of effects we spent our early playing years trying to avoid, but to control those effects precisely. Splitting a note into its harmonics was the first sound you heard in this film. And that's an extreme version of a squeak, that effect which embarrasses us and delights our colleagues in equal measure. It doesn't have to be as aggressive as in Magnus Lindbergh's bold opening statement. Listen to this passage from Alexander Gurr's paraphrase on the dramatic madrigal Il Combattimento di Tancredi e Clorinda by Claudio Monteverdi of 1973, probably one of the longest titles in the repertoire, where he uses multiphonics to represent shivers of fear in the restless night before a fight to the death. <laughs>
He also uses the sounds of the clarinet keys clicking, teeth chattering in fear or cold, perhaps. Gurr uses glissandi, not jazzily, but for the sounds of battle, and flutter tongue, where the tongue rolls against the reed rather than articulating normally. Gurr uses a number of what we might call contemporary effects, but crucially, not for their own sake, but to considerable musical and dramatic effect. That's an important point. There needs to be a compelling reason for including something in a composition. spent time, perhaps in our very first clarinet lessons, trying to avoid air escaping from our mouths as we blow down the clarinet. But in today's music, we're sometimes instructed not only to let air escape, but to play with perhaps only air, or a mixture of air and tone. In Tom Colt's opera Violet, premiered only a week or so before we made this film, he asks the wind players together to increase, then decrease in intensity, as we blow air through the instruments. Another example of this skillful use of air sound, this time mixed with tone, is also clear in this passage from Icon by Emma Ruth Richards, where the blurred effect highlights the clarity of the more normal sounds around it. The tonality, which is the basis for most music with which I grew up, using normal piano scales consisting of the black and white notes of the keyboard, was of course not the norm for much of our pre-classical history and has never been the norm in many parts of the world. The idea of splitting a semitone into two quarter tones or even smaller microtones predates Western classical music by many centuries and has often been a feature of jazz improvisation, but it still sounds somewhat alien to our ears. Sebastian Bell, the London Sinfonietta's founder principal flute, specialised in playing quarter tone versions of well-known tunes when he was warming up before a concert, such as this squashed version of the Habanera from Carmen. A fun party trick, of course, but listen to how Edison Denisov combines quarter tones with glissandi to create a sense of nervous exploration at the opening of his solo clarinet sonata. There isn't time in this short introduction to the contemporary clarinet, where the only rule for today's composers is that there are no rules, to cover everything. I haven't covered slap-tonguing or circular breathing, for example, 
but no matter. There are countless sources of information on contemporary playing techniques, including Bruno Bartolozzi's pioneering New Sounds for Woodwind of 1967. And these are invaluable to players and composers, but I would urge composers to beware. Think back to Stravinsky in 1919 and how he wrote three short pieces, each new in sound and each finding a clear voice for the instrument. In this film, I've tried to choose some examples of composers using modern techniques in a way that means something dramatically and emotionally, and which explores their idea of the clarinet's personality. I hope you'll perhaps go on to listen to the complete pieces and maybe explore some others. Contemporary doesn't have to mean complex. I'll leave you with this piece from Simon Holt's Brief Candles. It's called Art Object. 